I'm going to share screen and we're going to do this. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Prince of Wales Fort, um, a little bit of its history and a little bit about conservation possibilities. So uh, I was a professor at the university for numerous years. I've just retired and this work was done by a brilliant young lady called Andrea Isfeld. I'm sure you'll realize that when I get a little bit further in. Uh, and I, it was a great privilege to be able to supervise her through her PhD uh, on this particular topic. So the Prince of Wales Fort is all to do with fur trade and making money. So these are the major um, places with respect to the fur trade in Canada. Fur trade began in the 1600s and was very lucrative and the French were running it out of Montreal, um, obviously in shipping, shipping fur to Europe. And the British wanted to get in on the act. Um, and of course, with Quebec and Montreal being in French hands, it's rather difficult for the British to get up through the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes. So the Hudson's Bay Company was formed in 1670 with the idea that the British would then come around in the summer down into Hudson's Bay here uh, and collect the furs uh, first at York Factory, um, which was uh, the um, place where the, the uh, woodmen would come in the spring. Uh, but then they decided that it was a better travel to get down the Churchill River and end at the Prince of Wales Fort, which was built at the end of the Churchill River, rather than coming down the Nelson River. Nelson River was easy enough. Or well, let's just do what the French did. So the French would start from Montreal in the spring, come up the Ottawa River, cross over, come down French River, and then work away along the coast of the Great Lakes to get to Grand Portage. Uh, so that would be the, the group with the bigger boats. In the meanwhile, uh, the people who the Cour du Bois would be running down the rivers. So this is South Saskatchewan, North Saskatchewan, come to Cumberland House, come across the La Paz, down Lake Winnipeg, uh, and then down through a portage through the Verundi National Park now to Grand Portage. So this would be about a three month trip this way. For these guys, it was a three month trip this way. They would meet and transfer all the furs in about July, and then the Montreal groups would, would take their bigger boats uh, and go back this route back to Montreal, while the Cour du Bois would go back up to the hunting grounds in the upper regions. So, if the in the area of the Fort Chipayan and and the nor more northerly sections, you had to have quite a trek to get into or a portage to get into the lower region to be able to get to Grand Portage. So for the French, it was three months for these people to get down to Grand Portage, three months back and spend the winter. And for the Montreal people, three months to get across the Grand Portage and three months to get back again. And they stayed for about a month together at Grand Portage, which now unfortunately is in the US, but the river down which they came to Grand Portage is all in Canada here. Uh, as I said, in the Verundi National Park. So the British wanted to do something more efficient. So they would come round in the summer with their boat to initially York Factory, where <clears throat> it was fairly easy to get to that um, from the north and south of Saskatchewan, Cumberland House, La Paz, the top end of Lake Winnipeg, and then down the Nelson River to York Factory. Uh, for the people in the north, you had the big portage you had to deal with. So for these areas here, it was more efficient to be able to go down the Churchill River to, uh, to this location, the mouth of the Churchill River. So the Hudson's Bay Company decided that given the way that the French and the British were all fighting each other and stealing each other's furs, um, that they would create a big fort at the mouth of the Churchill River and it was called the Prince of Wales Fort. So this is the location here. So this is the Churchill River, the mouth coming out to Hudson's Bay. Prince of Wales Fort is on this uh, promontory here, Cape Mary. They put a battery of six cannon here as well when they built the fort um, to help protect the route in. 
and and modern day Churchill Manitoba is just here. So this is the fort, uh, as you can see, um, leading out to Hudson's Bay. Uh, this is the southwest corner, southeast. It's not quite lying north south. Uh, we'll see a plan in a minute. Uh, it was built in the Vauban style. Um, you can see some areas here of restoration in, in uh, 2014 15 hasn't changed much since because Parks Canada has not done anything in the meantime, as far as I'm aware, given um, COVID. So these are restoration areas uh, along the thing. This is the Raveline because the entrance to the fort is here. Um, there's no other entrance to the fort, just one entrance on this southwest facing face of the fort uh, and of course to protect that entrance from cannon fire you built this raveline so that if you put a cannon here you couldn't actually hit the the doorway you'd hit the raveline instead the uh, cannon up on the top um, by my count 39 cannon and remember the number 39 we'll come back to that in a minute uh, 39 cannon on the top uh, would have uh, enfilade fire on anybody trying to attack uh, into trying to get into the fort. So this is a plan of the fort. Uh, you can see north is in this direction, so it's not lying on a north-south. The only one and only gate is here, protected by the raveline at the front. Um, there, there's a house inside for personnel and then storage houses on this side where they would store the furs that were coming in. Rampart, um, all the way around here, on which the guns were sitting, and then the embrasures for the guns at these locations. Uh, so it was constructed between 1731 and 1771. So it was done by English engineers. The style is that of Vauban, French. Um, typically what would happen then is a boat would arrive with about 50 men, masons and engineers um, on the one boat and then they would work for the summer and then they would go back to the UK. They um, originally did it all with rough stone. There's no obvious quarry so the stones were probably just hauled off the beach or equivalent to that in order to make the walls of the fort. Uh, it wasn't until 1748, 1771 that they changed the face and had an ashlar face to make the face of the walls smooth so that they weren't so easily climbed. Okay, they used a mud mortar rather than um, a cement based mortar uh, and the stones were so heavy that frequently they would squish the mortar out of the way when one stone was put on top of another so that you had typically stone to stone contact rather than stone mortar stone uh, so the mortar was pushed out of the ways uh, and we had these direct stone on stone contact as a fairly typical within the wall now in 1782 um, after the fort had been <coughs> constructed <coughs> functioning doing very well for british trade uh, the french decided they wanted to wreck british trade because the British were making too much money. Uh, Hudson's Bay Company was doing very well, thank you very much. And the French wanted to stop that. So they came into Hudson's Bay with uh, three boats, 400 Marines um, came to the fort. The 39 men in the fort I gave up without a shot. Now remember the 39 cannon here on this fort and there were six over on the other headland. They didn't even have enough people for one per cannon. But of course, cannon in those times, you needed more than one person per cannon. So in that sense, the fort was heavily undermanned in order to be able to defend itself because you couldn't fire all the cannon um, with 39 men anyway, let alone go across the, the um, estuary and fire anything from the little set of six cannon on the other headland. So the French came in. They burned the houses internally, uh, so that's all that's left inside is, as you can see in the bottom picture, uh, with some shells of the houses and the storage rooms. Uh, then they blew up the revel in and they blew up the entranceway. So the entranceway is here. You can see it's been knocked down. 
um, and various parts of the ramparts were knocked down. The original ramparts in 1731 to 1771, uh, instead of building up uh, stonework between the gun embrasures, they just put um, uh, boxes filled with sand. But as they repaired it in the 1748 to 1771, where they changed it to this nice ashlar facing, uh, then they built actual stone uh, ramparts between the gun embrasures. So this is what Joseph Terrell thought of the place. I'll, I'll let you read that. Uh, he visited in 1894 when some of it had been, you know, obviously none of it had been repaired and it was still in a state of disrepair because it wasn't used after the French uh, basically made it useless. So it had sat there for 110 years or so doing nothing um, when Tyrrell saw it. So it's important to note that it, he saw it in poor condition, and but the interior of the wall is a rubble of boulders held together by poor mortar. It was a, a mud mortar. Um, they only, when they redid the building or the structure in 1748 to 1777 or so, they used a lime mortar on, on the ashlars, but everything else was a mud mud mortar and it's it's good to remember that it was a mud mortar so in 1920s it was declared a national historic site um, and then some of the bits were repaired in the 1930s particularly the southwest wall uh, again I'll, I'll show you that on on a plan in a minute the southwest wall was restored but it was it was in the restoration, instead of building the wall as normal, as shown here, which is the face stones with the rubble stone behind, what they did was dig a bit of a challenge, channel and set a concrete backing to help the wall uh, uh, stay, stay, stay straight and stay up. So the 1930s repair changed the backing of the wall in the areas that were repaired in the 1930s. Uh, and it was put back, they repaired the entranceway, they repaired the, av the raveline, uh, so it looks good except for the internal houses, which still are just um, shells of the original structure. Um, when they did some of the ramparts uh, to, between the gun embrasures, they, uh, the parapets there, they used concrete to stabilize them and they just poured in concrete until those parapets were stable. Um, so they added a lot of weight, uh, which uh, as you'll see when we get into doing uh, an analysis of what's going on, um, that wasn't the smartest things to have done given what's happened in the subsequent century. So the walls, uh, this is a wall with a parapet here. So um, the rampart where the guns were standing were here, the gun embrasure, the gun would fire out between two sections of parapets. So the walls are 4.8 meters tall, um, with behind them at the three meter high rampart. So the parapet is 1.8 meters high, so pretty high. Um, the foundation here, 2.1 meters deep which is uh, seven feet deep and 2.75 meters, 2.7 meters wide or um, nine feet wide. Uh, this is what we see as the cross section is typical, what's called three wife masonry. So um, a typical large wall built in those times and things in the European cathedrals, European castles and forts are all typically this. Um, they have nice face stones down the outside to make them look nice and clear. And again, nice face stones on the inside of the wall and then the middle of the fort wall is filled with rubble as is the usual way. Now in a, say a medieval castle, uh, they would have thrown in shards and mortar into here. Uh, so it would be a, a solid mass. What happened here was that when they put these stones in in the middle, they were sitting them on a mud mortar. So they're just using mud to try and intersperse between the stones. And the stones, as I said, were so heavy that they would just squish the mud out of the way. 
then in the following winter following that bit of construction the mud would freeze and so when they came back the following summer um, especially on the northern walls they were dealing with something that stayed frozen uh, so that you know as they built the wall up it stayed solid because it was basically ice with a mud context um, holding the stones together uh, and that has been one of the issues in our view about what went wrong and why they needed repairing um, so initially these were split boulders and then in the in the second set of construction they made these face stones uh, and made them smooth now the stone that they use is very strong which is why obviously they didn't do much carving and cutting of it because it was just hard work to try and get anything smooth and straight with such hard stone um, so local quartzite uh, and the dollar stone as it's called are much the same uh, strength with some variation um, small variability but very very strong very very hard laying in this mud or clay mortar in the core uh, and as you can see in these pictures and, and i'll show you a couple more in a minute there's a very high variance in the size and shape of these face stones and of the internal stones in the, in the core of the masonry um, the heaviest stones so far that we're aware of weighed 2000 kilograms so that's about two tons um, so you can imagine that it's not easy to move these and get them in place and hold them steady. Uh, so the problem that has happened is that now is that the the curtain wall here, the front of the curtain wall is bulging out, you can see here, and it's been stabilized and held in place um, with this woodwork. But this is the problem is that this the walls are bulging. Uh, now it was thought, initially that this was a problem of of water getting into the ramparts and putting pressure on the wall and causing the wall to bulge so parks canada who are now responsible for this fort um, spent a fair bit of your tax dollars putting in a drainage system in in the rampart uh, and this was continually monitored from 1999 i think it was onwards uh, and even though they put in um, all of the drainage in the in the ramparts it didn't have any effect on the rate at which these walls were bulging so uh, w i was asked to try and work out what was going on and as i said uh, andrea well, um did a fantastic job of trying to work out what was going on so we had the advantage a little bit that <clears throat> they'd already started restoration because uh, some of the walls had fallen down as you see on the right um, and you can see the different size of stones in here uh, one of the things that we had the advantage of and you can again just to try and show you some of the splitting of the wall here um, this is one of the working sites um, where the repairs are being done and you can see that there's a considerable bulge in the wall of, uh, with the stones moving. Uh, so when we look at the inside of a wall, again, different sized stones all over the place, just lying one on top of another. But <clears throat> so the current method is to remove the face stones, stabilize the core using um, trying to mark where all the stone face stones came from. Uh, mark where all the big stones come from the core, then stabilize them, building up, um, placing stones, uh, and then shimming them with other little stones to try and make them uh, more stable. Uh, it takes two years because at the moment work crews will go and work for two months in the summer when it's reasonably warm, uh, and that's about it. Then they will leave and come back the following year for another two months uh, when they can work everything um, and finish that section. So they're doing very small sections at a very slow rate. Uh, and the walls are showing more and more signs of trouble. So they were asking us uh, what was causing the trouble and what could they do possibly to stabilize the walls without having to do this extremely labor-intensive, slow, and a costly method of, of preserving the, 
the fort. Uh, so this is just showing again now we on the right um, stones where they're going to try and stabilize the next stone coming in. They're using a, a lime based mortar, a cement based mortar to now sort of mud. Uh, this is how they have to lift the stones. Uh, each stone, as I said, being marked as it's removed and then put back roughly in the right place. Our advantage was that, that um, although we know that the sizes of the stones were very, very different, is that there were big spaces between the stones where, not, where there was nothing there, no mortar at all. Uh, and what we had thought was that over the years, um, given the amount of rain and snow that lands on the fort, and that must be falling down through the wall, it was slowly washing out that mud. So, can we all mute, please? Uh, <clears throat> So uh, we knew that, the, that basically there was in the internal core of the wall, there was very little mortar, if you want to call it that, if any, um, it had been severely washed away by you know, every year, snow melting, rain hitting, uh, slowly washing away everything. So when we came to do the analysis, we didn't think that it was um, a water problem in the sense of water pressure, but it was water problem in the sense that it had removed the stabilizing element in the interior, it had removed the mortar that was there. So fiber scope was used to sort of have a look inside the wall. So you can see on this particular section, fiber scope down to the, this is section one, which is down here. Fiber scope down to the bottom of that split boulder, clean stone surface. Um, so no mortar on it, all been washed away. Uh, similarly for zone two, no mortar in here, and then we've got some little stones in here in, in zone three. So basically what we reckoned was there was, was a pile of stones, which were just sitting one on top of another, because that was the way that they had formed when they were put in. The mortar, the mud mortar was just squished out of the way, there was direct contact, and then the, the mud mortar had filled these voids, providing some cohesion. But then that had been washed away over the years. So um, what we would loan look at was the level of threat of different sections. Um, so this section down here in the gray, it was the southwest corner. This was the one that had fallen down and, uh, and by the 1920s needed rebuilding completely. Uh, so that was rebuilt uh, with the method of the concrete backing. Uh, as were a couple of other sections on this on this south face. So this is the face that was getting the sun uh, and therefore melting the, the ice in the wall sooner than anywhere else, uh, this southwest corner, and it suffered first and has been rebuilt, obviously, in the 1930s. The risky bits now uh, are this northwest corner where we, we saw the bulging and this southeast corner of the big bulging. Um, stabilized, as you can see, with the stabilizers to try and stop it falling out. Um, and then these other areas where now they're seeing that the walls are bulging, but uh, at the moment uh, they don't need to stabilize the wall in those locations, particularly. Uh, so you can see the general layout of the fort again um, with the rampart around the side where the guns were staying, the one entrance. This is the living quarters and this was the storage quarters. So the problem that we thought was going on was, was simply climate change that uh, temperatures are slowly increasing in um, Churchill over the years. And this would mean that the core of the walls, instead of being ice throughout the year, which was what was observed in construction, um, would now potentially start to melt. Uh, and thaw out and then rain coming down uh, on the snow melting would slowly wash out that mud mortar. Shouldn't have had any effect on the lime mortar uh, as long as the lime mortar had cured, which is a good question, had it cured or not given the temperatures, uh, but certainly the mud was we reckoned washed out. So we were asked to try and say, well, what's going on? 
Um, so we started off, or I, Andrea started off, using discrete elements, a discrete element model. So basically what that is, um, is a model you can use basically circles or rectangles. It's a planar model. It just deals with contact. If the sum of the forces, so you get a, a, wherever there's contact, you get normal force and a frictional force. Uh, the only other force that will act is self-weight. Uh, if the sum of the forces and the sum of the moments don't come to zero, then you're going to get movement. So you've got to know the line of action of the forces. So you've got to know where are the contact points. You have a normal force at the contact point. You have a frictional force at the contact point. You, you assign uh, a coefficient of friction. And if, as I said, if the sum of the forces and the sum of the moments don't come to zero, then you're going to get movement. So what we were going interested in was modeling the bond conditions within the wall. Uh, were the wall stable or unstable and what allowed it to shift from stability to instability? What level of friction that would occur and how does that relate to the normal friction between stones? Uh, and if there was increased cohesion, would that give us stability? And then the impact of varying geometry, because we know that the walls internally were not all precisely the same as you go around the wall. So to start with, we just use this method um, in, in A, for example, and C and D, we had uh, extra stones up at the top to simulate the concrete that was put in the parapets. And the bulging is, only, is typically under a parapet. It's not under a gun embrasure. So uh, we knew that it was something to do with the weight because that parapet made the difference. Uh, so we looked at different sets of um, face stones, different sets of internal arrangement of, of the circles, allowing for different sized stones. Uh, and we assigned a normal and tangential components to get the cohesion and the friction. And then just said, OK, under self-weight, what happens? Uh, so shear bands start to develop. So a shear band starts to develop and the outer place is displaced um, with the core moving and the face stones will rotate. Uh, as you can watch this, it's just self-weight, just let it do its own thing. So it's just like any pile of stones, it wants to find the angle of repose, but because it's not going to uh, find the angle in the original picture, then um, it tends to fall down. And what we found was that it didn't really matter what the geometry was. They would all tend to, so this one is bulging at the middle here with that. This one's bulging mostly down at the bottom, as is this one. This one's up at the middle. So the bulging was basically what was being observed. We could see this bulging occurring in all of the models, and it didn't matter what model you made, the bulging would occur from somewhere in the base up towards the middle of the wall. And that basically the weight wants to just push the stones out and push the face stones out, just as observed in, in the actual walls themselves. So that told us that. Um, we might have the right idea, um, but this is very uh, simplistic way of looking at it, but at least it told us that um, this was a possible cause of the problems that were being observed on the fort. So given what we did with the, that discrete element system, it, if you made things high enough and big enough friction, you could get stability, uh, but these were totally unrealistic values. Um, we realized that we had stone interactions that were simplified, very much simplified. Um, we didn't allow interlocking of the stones, um, and it wasn't really realistic geometry, but it gave us the idea that this was probably the cause of the problem. That if you make a pile of stones, they na naturally want to sit at a, at a set angle of repose, and these stones in the core were not at their natural angle of repose. So we then needed to think, well, OK, how can you stabilize this? And a lot of information from Italy in particular said that if you grout inject uh, walls like this, you can stabilize them. 
So we thought, okay, well, let's see if we can stabilize these walls by grout injection. Um, but let's be more realistic about the geometry. So we used the finite element method then to be a bit more precise about um, the geometry and whether or not we could inject grout and stabilize the walls. So um, we knew from what had gone on in a lot of Italian research uh, that if you inject grout and you get out of, uh, fill up all the voids, um, you have a really good impact on the compressive strength of the wall as a whole uh, and its shear capacity. So um, you make it essentially a, a homogenized single material uh, and therefore it can stay together quite well. But um, we again had to do this through numerical modeling because there was no other choices given the situation that we're faced with. So uh, Andrea created this finite element model and she just gave the stones linear elastic material properties because um, they're not going to deform much. Uh, they're just under self weight so the stresses on them are not particularly high. So what happens is you get point contacts and, and local high stresses at local areas. But again, given the strength of those stones, uh, it was unlikely that you were going to get up to a, um, 180 MPA strength. There is friction between stones, so we allowed for friction uh, on the condensial, uh, on, on the boundaries and in the interfaces. We fixed the bottom of the wall down here. This was fixed, so we said, okay, well, it's sitting in a foundation. The soil up to um, 2.1 meters, so soil up to here somewhere. Uh, we didn't put any constraints on these levels. We just put constraints on the bottom. Uh, and then we just said, okay, under self-weight, what's going to happen? Um, and just let it do its own thing. And basically what it does is exactly the same as the discrete element models. Then we wanted to look at whether um, if you filled it full of grout, what would happen? So then you had to, to take all of these spaces, all of these voids, and you had to fill it with a different material to the stone. So you could uh, now have a solid wall where you have the stone as one material and, and the grout as another. And the question then is, well, what causes the model to fail? And we were interested in the properties of the grout and the contact properties between the stones. So we saw um, very similar failure to um, the discrete element model. So let me run this one. Uh, you see the shear bands developing, the movements of the wall, and now the wall is bulging. Um, cracks are formed internally and, and the wall will uh, fail. So uh, the finite element model did exactly the same as the discrete element model showed the same type of failure. And then the questions really become is how do you stop this happening? So uh, the modulus of the, of the grout is really important. So we knew what the properties of the stone were. So what level of grout do you need to be able to put in there? How strong a grout do you need to be able to put in there in order to stabilize the wall? Could you put in any old grout? Didn't really matter what, or did it have to have minimum properties that would keep the wall together? Uh, so that was what we were looking at first. So we looked at the modulus of the grout, um, how stiff it was. And what we found was that, yeah, within a reasonable range of normal grout, so you have to get down to a very low, poor grout, before uh, you would get instability. So um, most grouts that you would use um, would be okay and would do the job from the point of view of modulus. And then we looked also at the friction between the stones and said, okay, if you reduce the friction between the stones, uh, what happens even if you've got a modulus of grout that would give you um, stability under other circumstances? And we found that the modulus, uh, the friction was really important. Uh, so then you have to know what the friction is on average between the stones um, in order to make it sensible, uh, a sensible answer for Parks Canada to tell them what they need to do. So lastly, then we said, okay, um, 
we realize that there's variability in the grout properties and we realize that there's variability in the stones. So the stones, yeah, they're 180 MPA, but it's plus or minus a little bit. So we better allow them to vary. But more importantly, we need to allow the grout to vary because you, you make one batch of grout, okay, you pump it in. Then you make another batch of grout and you pump it in. It's not going to be the same as the first batch. So you have to allow that, that, that you make batch after batch after batch after batch of, of grout. The properties are not going to be the same. So what happens if you happen to put um, a, a poor batch of grout in at the bottom and a stronger batch of grout somewhere else? So we used a, a Monte Carlo simulation. Basically, we said, OK, all of these pieces and all different colors you can see in the picture, all of these pieces will have randomly assigned values of properties within the range that we would say. So 180 MPA plus or minus 5 MPA for the stone. And then the grout, depending on the, the um, strength that you choose, your target strength plus or minus 15 or 20 percent. So that you would then say, OK, this little bit down here has got one strength, whereas this little bit here has got a slightly different strength. This bit's got another slightly different strength. And we assigned all of those properties. So you can see this one here is light green as the same as that one. So these two would have the same properties and so on. And we just assigned it randomly to all of the voids for the grout properties and randomly to all of the stones for the stone properties. And then you, you run the model over and over and over again, trying to get a sense of um, what the variability does and what the strengths do to giving you stability or not giving you stability. What we found when we did a sensitivity analysis is that the frictional coefficient is by far the most important parameter, just the friction between the stones. So it's, they're sliding, they've got rough surfaces, they've got a fairly high coefficient of friction, which is good. And then the next most important thing was the compressive strength of the grout. Um, so those are the two things that really you've got to look at um, and think about, well, how strong do I need that grout to be in order to provide stability to the wall? And if you <clears throat> look at the lateral displacement of the wall uh, leading to failure, um, you can take a fair range of grouts. Um, so the probability of failure, um, getting up into the 90% range with a certain minimum grout strength, what we worked out was that actually an oil well cement would be good enough. If you could get an oil well cement and pump it in there, uh, it would do the trick. So uh, you don't need to have that strong a grout in order to be able to stabilize the walls. So our FEM conclusions were that the model failed similarly to the discrete element model, that very idealized model, that, that basically was giving us the right sense of what was going on what the problem was grout injection seemed to be a very feasible option it's a much better option than trying to tie the bits of the wall together if you tie the stones together you've got to tie every stone to every stone and that's a ridiculous way of doing it it's just as bad as what they're doing now so the grout injection seemed to be the most sensible and feasible option for further stopping any further degradation of the wall um, and a large range of grout modulus was shown to be able to control it. Um, and in particular, we were interested in the lower level of what was the minimum strength. And most grouts um, would easily meet the minimum strength that we needed to give us stability of the walls. So that was the recommendation we made to Parks Canada that they, instead of doing what they're doing uh, on the bits of the walls that aren't falling apart, now do grout injection to stabilize them. Uh, it'll save them a lot of money in the wrong, long run. And just as that was recommendation was going in, guess what the federal government did but cut the, pub, cut the uh, budget to Parks Canada. So they haven't been able to do anything since uh, we made that recommendation, which is unfortunate. So we would like to acknowledge uh, NSERC, uh, Natural Sciences Engineering Research Council of Canada, and the University of Calgary for helping us do this work. Uh, these are the references that were hidden away in some of the slides. Uh, Lynn Fontaine did the climate change one, so she provided those data on, on the climate change over the years there. Uh, we worked with the Heritage Conservation Directorate um, of the federal government to do this. Uh, so they, again, they gave us a lot of advice and help. And uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have.
in which case I will stop screen sharing with a bit of luck. No, I don't want to do that. I want to stop screen sharing. Oh, stop sharing there. Right. Okay. Any questions from anybody? Uh, I'm not hearing any, so I will 